and change there. Uh, thank you, Maktil. Thank you, Noor, Abba, and Leo for organizing this. I'm very grateful uh, to be here and to you know present some ideas uh, which are always in development. By the way, there's never really anything finished that I that I have to say. Um, so yeah, bear with me and please ask questions as much as you can. Uh, so let me share my screen if that's okay. Yeah. That's the one. So th there are so many ways to, and you know, I was thinking how to do this. Uh, this is um, trying to talk about um, 500 years of history um, around the world. <laughs> how does one do it? How does one do it in half an hour? How does one do it at all? So, um, I have uh, chosen a strategy to start with a story and then to move to more general issues. But obviously this can be done in hundreds of different ways. And uh, I hope uh, what I'm going to say is interesting and, and you know, uh, thought, thought provoking in some sense of the word. Um, but equally, um, if you see me next time, uh, please uh, expect something else because I probably won't say the same thing again. Um, so anyway, here we are. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to start with a story uh, about um, a dominating uh, transition. Uh, what, could, what could be called the mobility transition or has been called the mobility transition to electric vehicles and the wider renewable energy transition associated with it. Um, and I'm going to then situate, situate, try to situate that story in a very brief history of plunder for profit, um, and that plunder for profit being uh, a colonial phenomenon that I will try to highlight. And from there, I'll move on to the construction, the, the formation of uh, world systems, if you wish, for the lack of a better word, uh, of colonial modernities, there, whose job, uh, the systems which are geared towards the production of concentration of privilege in certain parts of the world, in certain pockets all around the world. And then I will then talk about, well, how do we, how do we transform those uh, world systems, those colonial modernities that have been established and entrenched to such an extent that we don't often see them, we don't often recognize them. Um, and, you know, that's, it's also an interesting, for example, I was also thinking perhaps one way to do this uh, talk would be, and I started doing that, but then abandoned the idea, would be to go look at um, the literature on some literature on regimes and transitions and to see how that literature addresses this phenomenon of you know colonialism that has constituted our world in in uh, incredible ways and then start looking at how studies have invoked colonialism and how they have uh, addressed it uh, but then gave up the idea because it uh, First of all, there are about a thousand studies that have done that. Uh, you know, it would have been, it would have taken me a long time to go through all of them. And then to just present a slice of them, I felt didn't do justice to the various ways in which it has been engaged with. Um, but it was rare to find, even though, you know, I did a little bit of work, it was rare to find scholarship within transition studies that actually be went beyond just invoking colonialism a few times, a uh, couple of times, sometimes just once by making it integral to the analysis of constitution of regimes. Regimes, for example, that are considered archetypical in transition studies from uh, steam uh, sail ships to steamships, from horse carriages to automobiles. These happened within colonial flows, colonial circuits uh, that have concentrated privilege and power in the global North. So, but often these, these concentrations, these colonial flows, colonial circuits are left outside the picture of the regime shifts that we talk about. Um, and then finally, in the last part of the talk today, um, I will talk about four uh, ideas of decolonization, again, building upon a lot of literature out there. Um, firstly, anti-racist equality, second, autonomy or territorial sovereignty. Third, epistem epistemic or epistemological disobedience, or one might call it freedom as well. And then finally, uh, ontological plural pluralism that has been addressed through the concept of the pluriverse. And finally, I hope if I have the time, I will end with some 
examples of different aspects of decolonial ways of living uh, for sustainability. Okay, uh, here we go. Oh, wait a second, sorry, what happened to my slides? There's no, is there a title on this slide? Because I can't see it. Uh, yeah, it says white gold. Right, there is a title. Thank you, thank you, Leo. Um, so this is a very large um, lithium mine um, in Bolivia. Uh, it's one of the world's largest salt lands or salt flats or salt pans as they're called. And um, those little rectangles you see in the picture are uh, drying ponds in which brine is drying to produce lithium and different colors reflect different concentrations of lithium in it as water dries more and more lithium gets produced. Uh, more and more lithium gets crystallized or lithium, lithium some other comp uh, composition in, involving lithium, it's a lithium carbonate, I can't remember what exactly it is, but it's getting produced there. Now, um, what, half the world's sort of uh, lithium reserves are in Bolivia, Chile, and this is uh, the Atacama, Atacama Desert in, in Chile. Um, shown from space, by the way, uh, take a picture taken by the European Space Agency. Um, and here you can see drying ponds for lithium again in different colors um, over perhaps thousands of hectares of land. Um, and here, uh, closing the triangle uh, is Argentina. Uh, and this is the salt pan of the dead man or the dead man's salt pan, Salar del Hombre Muerto. Uh, and it is here that I want to tell a brief story from the ground. Um, there is a mine here called the Phoenix Mine uh, run by Minera del Altiplano. And Minera del Altiplano is a subsidiary of uh, Livent. Uh, Livent is an American, North American company, um, which a couple of years ago, I, I think the, the, their plan, in fact, was to complete this expansion this year in 2022. But this expansion was being planned um, and I think approved by the, the, the government, but was being opposed uh, by the local community uh, uh, who called themselves the Atacameños del Altiplano. Um, and um, they were opposing it because they were worried about a lot of different things associated with this proposed expansion which would, by the way, double the capacity of the existing mine operated by Minera del Altiplano. So according to an environmental organization based in Argentina, Fundación Ambiente y Recursos Naturales, the impact of this expanded mining would include the extraction of 650,000 liters of water being drawn each hour uh, out of the Los Patos River there. Now, the same report added um, that the drying up of plains and rivers, which is to be expected because mining for lithium requires a lot of water, um, is just the tip of the iceberg of an environmental deterioration on the fragile balance of Puna Plateau and the violation of rights of indigenous people and the communities that inhabit that place. Um, and other impacts obviously include uh, agricultural problems that when water available, available groundwater for agriculture gets salinated. Uh, so the firm claims that they will only, they're only extracting brine from the groundwater. So that means freshwater sources are untouched, but the aquifer is the same. Uh, there is a <laughs> brine, concentrated brine in, in some part, that gets less and less concentrated. And finally, we get to the fresh water. Uh, now, obviously, if you're taking brine out, flows inside will create a situation where eventually, sooner or later, you might find uh, that fresh water gets uh, salinated as well. And um, in any case, drying up of, 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 uh, of rivers uh, or of pastures or meadows uh, which exist in this area um, are uh, an issue that have been raised by, for example, many people, including uh, the local community leader, uh, Roman Guitan, who witnessed large scale death of trout in his 
in his region. And thinking about that, he starts to worry about the uh, dispossession, if you, if you wish, of a way of life, not just of land or of water. Uh, now he says, that's why we are afraid that the same thing will happen with the meadow, what has happened with the death of large scale death of crowd, the meadow where I live. Uh, we use it from December to March. It feeds sheep, yamas, vicuñas, ducks, seagulls. It's a beautiful place, he said. If they end up drying that up, we will lose it all. Now, as I said, half the world's uh, lithium reserves are here. So this is um, emerging stories. There's not much research on it yet, uh, but I think it is happening as we speak. And um, the impacts on uh, people living in these communities, which are going to be affected, um, are uh, you know, going to be quite devastating. And now, th this is, of course, not just about lithium. Um, lithium is part of a big puzzle, obviously, that is required for this mobility transition. There's sand involved, there's aluminum, copper, cobalt, uh, about which a lot of stories from the Congo are also emerging now. Um, that, um, that this extractivism that is happening in the name of renewable energy and sustainability needs to be uh, given more attention to. And whether that extractivism reproduces, um, reenacts, if you wish, is rep reproduction is not perhaps the right term because always things that are done now are quite different from the things that were done in the past, but reenacts perhaps an enactment as a concept allows a little bit of a flexibility and, and friction and um, uh, slippages uh, to be taken into account rather than reproduction uh, allows. So here uh, in this, area in the Atacama Desert. If It's a big desert. So if you go 900 kilometers north of where Roman lives to, to um, the eastern fringe of the desert in Bolivia, there's a town, a desert town called uh, Potosi. Now Potosi um, used to be famous for um, mining of silver. Has anybody heard of Potosi before? Uh, a lot of the silver in, in Europe uh, came from Potosi. In fact, it is estimated that 22,700 metric tons of silver was, it was taken from the mines in and around Potosi between 1545 and 1823. Now, if, to put, it, put this in perspective, this 22,695 metric tons of silver was about 60% of the total silver to be found in Europe, estimated to be found in Europe, obviously in 1500s, which was about 30, 30,000 tons, uh, 35, 35,000 tons. So um, huge amount of extraction that happened within the span of those two or three centuries. And obviously to do that extraction, not only do you need to take away land from other uses, but also you need labor. So in order to get the labor, uh, the, the Spanish adapted uh, of a system of, of labor, forced labor, you, if you wish, labor that was used by the Incas to do public services in the empire. They adapted that Mita system um, and uh, used a lot of, made it compulsory, for example, within an area of 200,000 square kilometers uh, around these mines, around, around Potosí, for every Native American to do at least one year of um, labor inside these mines in every seven years of their lives. So Jose Carlos Maratigui, who's a Peruvian, who was a Peruvian intellectual, philosopher, a political scientist, observed in 1928 that without the labor of American Indians, the treasury of Spain would have dwindled. And uh, obviously, this did not just come, um, this mining, mining never just comes as mining alone. It also comes with a whole uh, culture that it brings along. So here you can see on the, on the right hand side, the outside this hallway you go into the mine, there is a, there is a cross here, which obviously tells you that this is also about, uh, you know, bringing a religion alongside uh, exploiting labor and much more culturally speaking that is put in place in order for mines to work, processing to happen, things to be taken out. And 
um, lands to be extracted. So it had to be justified and um, at some point. So the way the Spanish justified, at least to themselves, is that they considered the collective land rights that existed among indigenous groups to be an anomaly. They thought land has to be owned privately um, or to be in the sovereign control of the king. Uh, so indigenous groups, the way their land ownership structures were, was considered to be backward, which they aim to civilize through centralized state control or through private property rights. Uh, and now, of course, this private property rights promotion continues in this area to this day throughout, you know, in the 21st century and throughout the 20th century, perhaps especially, but in the last five decades in, in what we call uh, neoliberalism. And there's an amazing book here that I'm citing, um, Bullens, that I can share the reference with you guys if you're interested in learning more about how this history has panned out, particularly in the case of water in the Atacama. And remember, it's a desert. And some of the in the, the the Salar de Uyuni that I showed you guys in the beginning, the first picture, uh, it's also some of the. It's probably the driest desert in the world outside of the North and South Pole. So not just a not just a uh, you know area there, a land that is that that is um, replete or flush with water, but um, where there is a huge shortage of uh, water that is available for people. Um, and of course, in this particular case in history, the extracted silver uh, was taken away uh, to be traded often as far as in India and China. In China, silver was in huge demand, it seems. It was twice as expensive as gold uh, in that part of the world. Okay, and now these were the, this is sort of a brief, um, brief jump into, jump back in time. Uh, and similar arguments for uh, sort of justification, such as, hey, these, these land rights are anomalous, so they're backward, have been used throughout history, colonial history. And, uh, you know, uh, if, if I had more time uh, and a lot more can be said about going into Australia, how, the, how Aboriginal lands were taken away or going to um, um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and talking about the scramble for Africa that took place between 1881 and 1914 particularly at the 1884 uh, uh, Berlin Conference, where this concept of territorium nullius was, in, was, was devised by a German law professor to justify the fact that land that was not under sovereign control of one of the European countries was supposedly no one's land. And there is a history behind territorium nullius, which goes back to terra nullius being used in Australia. Uh, and its variations, such as uh, the idea of the of wasteland that was used in India, which also, according to some people, inspired T. S. Eliot uh, to write his 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 famous poem. Now, uh, it seems the history behind Terranalius is this Roman uh, concept of res nullius, which was no one's things. If there are no one's things, they can be taken away by the first finder, the one who finds them first. So this is how justifications, legal, philosophical, conceptual justifications have been developed for plunder, for dispossession throughout uh, colonial history. Now, what justifications are given today? Now, here, of course, things have changed uh, quite substantially, in fact, away from colonial, you know, all, I'm not saying colonial discourses of backwardness are not used, particularly perhaps in, in some parts of development economics or development studies, they're still invoked as reasons to bring development to the third world, to the South. Uh, but always they come alongside these understandings that things, places are backward, places are lagging behind, places need to catch up. They always come with a certain promise of prosperity, a certain sets of promises of prosperity. And among them, particularly for mining, there is the question of jobs that is always put forward. So Argentina, for example, uh, heavily promotes minings of, mining of all kinds. Um, uh, oops, sorry. In Argentina, the sector, the mining sector pays practically no value added tax. Um, it has a very special regime for income tax too. In October, 2020, the export taxes on the sector were reduced from 12 to 8%. Uh, concessions are given in very favorable terms in different provinces, different states for mining. 
without the mines, uh, mining companies having to own the land is just given to them for exploitation. Um, and obviously other reasons are used as well for promoting these kinds of activities. We all know them very well, industrialization for economic growth, plans to develop entire electromobility and renewable energy value chains. Also in Argentina, these, these, this is being touted by ministers of the government. And obviously we've got the global imperative of, of decarbonization for climate resilience. And even though people recognize that there are these problems that are happening in certain localities in the world, localities that are being turned into sacrifice zones, we continue to justify it by saying this is necessary. This is the price that the humanity supposedly we are all one. Humanity has to pay for, for addressing the climate challenge. Now, in this process, obviously, we know that many alternative decarbonization pathways are marginalized, perhaps to protect um, investments, profits, and I will argue accumulated privilege. Now, in very simple terms, where is this accumulated privilege to be seen? Uh, this is a recent picture from the World Inequality Database. Here you can see average national income in different parts of the world. And obviously the North, it is heavily concentrated inside the global North. But the interesting factor here is the lower part of this picture where you can see that not much in terms of income disparity, if you overlook China, has changed between countries. The United States continues for the last almost 100 years to be at the peak and then followed by European countries, not very far behind. And then you get at the bottom, a country like Haiti, which has actually seen a fall in the last 100 years or 75 years in its per capita national income. So, um, or at least that's what the graph tells me, even if it is not a fall, it's practically stagnant. Now, um, this, this same picture can also be seen in the so-called SDG index, uh, which also shows that the top 10 countries that are supposedly most sustainable are in the global north. Now, let's forget about all those other parameters that are used to address unsustainability, such as the ecological footprint and all, you know, how much is their carbon concentration, how much biodiversity do they destroy in other parts of the world because of their lifestyles, that's besides the point. This is SDG index saying that these are the best countries. These are what everybody else should be aspiring to become. Um, so obviously you can say that this, this, this situation right now um, is not just the present. It has a history. Obviously we've come to this situation where um, privilege is maintained and sustained and is concentrated inside northern countries, northern regions of the world. Uh, and there is a reason behind it, historically speaking, that this privilege has been constrained. The, like the mine in Potosi uh, showed uh, that uh, cheapened resources, cheapened labor through enslavement, through indenture, uh, indenture after slavery was uh, officially abolished by many empires in the 19th century has been carried out since the invasion of the Americas in the late 15th century, 500 plus years of history of concentrating privilege. Now, from India alone, according to one recent estimate, at least $45 trillion were transferred into Britain. This is the conservative estimate according to Utsapat between 1765 and 1938. And even the transition scholars, some of them are now mapping modern slavery to be found even today in cobalt mining that is fueling um, you know, low carbon transitions in the North. So this inequality gets reproduced uh, over time and concentrations of privilege get reproduced over time or reenacted, as I said earlier, um, to make an unequal world in which Northern concentrations of privilege are built upon extraction, supremacy and control directed elsewhere. At the same time, um, this process of extraction, supremacy and control directed elsewhere, uh, as social material orders of the modern world, as the processes that build on which the modern world is sustained, maintained, uh, is also done through in the name of development. And in this name of development, modernization is equated to socioeconomic progress as the only way to develop post-colonial society. So recently I have a paper coming out 
on in Journal of International Development on looking at Kenyan agricultural policies uh, just before and after independence in 1960s. And what we find in that paper is that repeated success, we look at successions of policies still today, till this year, till 2019, I think, on agricultural development. And all of them, all of them very largely to the exclusion of all the alternatives that are there in farmers' knowledges, agroecologies, organic agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, to be promoted in the name of sustainable development, development are instead focusing exclusively, near exclusively on agricultural modernization, which is built upon these no amb ambitions to control nature and control labor, um, which are built upon large scale extraction of resources for industrial production, which are built upon inferiorization of indigenous ways of knowing and living, often as stagnant, anomalous, backward, um, in order to marginalize societal transformations based upon them. And this modernity, the problem here is that this, this, this modernity is not just, not just pushed onto people in the South. This is often embraced by, particularly in the post-colonial era, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s. It was embraced by native elites, including many nationalist leaders. You could think of Nehru in India, Jinnah in Pakistan, Nairere in Tanzania, Kenyatta in Kenya, Nkrumah in Ghana. Um, as a result of this embrace and their own attempts to address their own problems inside their own societies, they ended up producing what could be called uh, many alternative colonial modernities around the world with the following features, standardization, unequal accumulation, a certain sense of bureaucratic and institutional infrastructural order, a certain, certain emphasis on individualism that is reflected inside economic thinking and policy making based upon economic thinking, certain sets of binarisms, including of gender, but also much more widely between nature, culture, subjects, objects, et cetera, et cetera, which also then leads into uh, a rationalism of a particular kind that is built, built upon modern science that is universalized, extractivism, which I talked about, toxic trails that extractivism leaves behind, industrialization, infrastructures that are built in a particular way for promotion of automobility, for example, that is still an ongoing process in many southern parts of the world. These infrastructures are being heavily built in the form of flyovers. And uh, that's what I see, at least when I go to Indian cities, Indian engineers, I always say they love pouring concrete um, for these infrastructures. A certain sense of supremacy of certain ways, certain specific modern ways of knowing over other ways of knowing that I already talked about, supremacy that is race, racialized, white supremacy, casteist, casteist, Hindu casteist supremacy that is to be observed inside India, racism, casteism, um, and of course, enforcing certain forms of patriarchy and extending capitalism. Now, what this, these types of modernities, and of course, they, they manifest, they, they, they materialize in different ways in different parts of the world. That's why I'm also emphasizing uh, colonial modernities, they are produced out of plural ways of living, making, knowing that existed around the world 500 years ago that continue to exist perhaps in smaller numbers as languages die, cultures die, biodiversities die. Different ways of relating with nature are marginalized. Uh, through, they are pushed through this squeeze of colonialism, developmentalism and neoliberal globalization, the squeeze that could be very simply ter termed coloniality. And of course, um, that coloniality, its globalization, uh, produces concentrations of privilege all around the world. So it's not just about the North-South inequality. Now, you can see that some parts of the Global South are more unequal than some parts of the global, global North in terms of within country inequality. So there are pockets of privilege that are being produced, concentrations of privilege that are being produced very heavily all around the global south. You only need to go to uh, South Bombay to, to see some of those concentrations of privilege. Um, now, let me move to the final part of my talk today. I've laid out the problem on a beautiful spring day. Um, also have to talk about hope. Now here, um, decolonization, addressing these, these entrenchments of colonial modernities, of course, there are lots of processes underfoot over many, many years. Resistance against uh, coloniality goes back to as long as coloniality has existed. And um, that resistance has built, it has been often built upon a very strong collective commitment to anti-racist and anti-colonial praxis. 
some of them have been aimed at seeking, for example, the same rights and privileges for people who are subaltern, who are suppressed, who are oppressed, same rights and privileges for them as those, as those that are available to people advantaged by coloniality. Um, and here, of course, amazing social movements have been, uh, have been undertaken against race, racism and caste, which you all know about. Uh, but also equally, uh, there's been nationalist leaders, developmentalists have also thought that perhaps they could also be anti-racist and anti-colonial by trying to develop capabilities inside their own countries by getting some autonomy for that nationalist development from the North while pursuing modernization themselves, modernization on their terms, like the Nehru, Nehru and the Nairiris of the world that I talked about earlier. Uh, equally, that anti-colonial, anti-racist praxis also uh, has manifested in discussions for reparations, not that they have substantiate, substantively taken place in any part of the world, so far as I know, but there are discussions that are very, very, very heavily taking place, for example, in Jamaica, especially, um, but also in other parts of the world. Reparations, not just for enslavement, but also for uh, colonial pillage and violence. Uh, here, of course, the question of reparations has always got to discuss with well, reparations to what ends, to, to for more toxic modernization or something else. Uh, but perhaps uh, the case is clear for uh, the direct alleviation of poverty through cash transfers, et cetera. Uh, the debate is rich here and uh, obviously uh, many different strands to it. Second aspect of decolonization that I want to foreground today is uh, for autonomy. Here, the question of territorial sovereignty for subaltern groups comes to the fore for them to care for their lands, relations, and decisions beyond colonial modernities, not just within colonial modernities and seeking their transformation. It is about other worlds that they want to protect, other ways of living, other life ways. Now, here it's important to remember, as, as Eve Tuck and Yang already warned us in 2012 that decolonization is not another word for social justice. It's not a metaphor, but rather points in a very straightforward way to repatriation of land to indigenous peoples from whom it has been taken, particularly in settler colonies. So autonomy here. Oh, um, okay. Autonomy here um, points to, well, we must ask autonomy for whom, uh, autonomy for indigenous people, but then indigenous, indigenous identified how after centuries of, of um, you know, intermixing um, and constructions and concentrations of privilege, perhaps then the notion subaltern, which is always relational, which says people who are, um, you know, a small marginalized oppressed group uh, inside a bigger universal uh, question of minorities comes into the picture here. Uh, so for a people there defined ethnically, or perhaps if you follow Gandhi and Ivan Illich, you might say that this autonomy is to be granted or fought for for each individual, each community, and for society as a whole. Uh, so in that sense, this would be constitutive of what Ivan Illich has called conviviality, conviviality that can be then used as a basis for developing multiple quasi-autonomous pathways to sustainability. Uh, also, equally... Five minutes, thank you. Yeah, uh, you can take five or 10 minutes more. That's fine. I'll try to wrap up in five, seven minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Equally, um, autonomy here can be a quest for grassroots participatory democracy as has been emphasized, including what has been more, more recently at least made part of law, the law in many countries such as Argentina and Mexico for indigenous people, which is their free prior and informed consent uh, over any projects that are taking place in the, um, amidst them. Um, but always remember, remembering here that there's not one, but many, many different approaches to participatory democracy that we all know about. Um, Walter Mignolo um, talks about decolonization as epistemic disobedience, and here he points to these points to de the decentering of uh, dominant modern understandings of terms like democracy, governance, and freedom. So, for example, attack by attaching alternative cultural meanings to these terms. Uh, so, for example, in Isi Zulu, uh, democracy maybe is often represented as in Tando Yeningi, which is, which is pointing to the majoritarian rule idea of democracy through one person, one vote. Um, but another understanding of democracy, which a lot of people lament that was not picked up and made dominant, could be Umbuso Wabuntu. Umbuso literally just means rule, 
and Wabuntu by the people. But it's not just about rule. Umbuso also points to the good life, like you know, discussions on Buen Vivir, resonating with discussions on Buen Vivir in Latin America, good life and autonomous living. Um, so Umbuso then brings all of those connotations to the fore. Um, equally, uh, this, these kinds of understand, decentering modern understandings could also be done to governance. So in the Zapatista rebel and autonomous councils, the Zapatistas are rethinking governance, reenacting governance, governance not by, by making people obey, but not by command and control, but governance by obeying. So to propose, they say, not to imp impose, to go down, not to go up for governance. Um, and here the aim is to bring to the fore or get inspired by certain cultural aspects that may have been suppressed by coloniality. Uh, equally decolonizing for the pluriverse, that's my fourth uh, proposal. Uh, here the idea is to repair the socio-ecological technical basis of knowing in many other life ways, in many other ways of living, of many other ways of living. These bases of knowing are perhaps those, those life ways that have been damaged by coloniality. Uh, to use Kimberly Tolbeer's terms here, it will be to de-individualize oneself as a researcher, to de-individualize knowledge production by always working ourselves back into a web of relations, asking what it means to be in good relations with other beings, foregrounding ways of relating that are based in care, love, solidarity particularly with those harmed by colonial modernities, rather than based in control, extractivism and supremacy that I talked about earlier. And showing, demonstrating how decolonial life base, including indigenous life base can heal lands and relations by, by grasping, by understanding, by moving beyond modern silos, for example, between agriculture and forestry to talk about agroforestry more prominently, beyond binaries, obviously separating cultures, nature, sociality, materiality, spirituality from science and so on. Now, um, to talk about this pluriverse, to talk about these sustaining the flourishing of many ways of living uh, in the present, is not to point to the fact that there is there can be a global design, a single recipe for decolonization. In fact, I have just outlined four, and even for the last one, there is no single global design that we can put forward, as Walter Mignolo has argued. Um, a wide range of decolonial transformations, in fact, would be required or would be made necessary, particularly to colonial modernities situated in different configurations. Promoting, you know, to promote knowledges, designs, economies, cooperatives, and artifacts as aspects, not just objects, aspects of full-fledged life ways. And these are not objects or models to be scaled up for universality, for economic growth, for eco-modern expansion, but rather, again, something, things that are embedded, aspects that are embedded inside um, broader worlds, ways of living, ways of relating with each other and with nature. Equally, seeking intersectional equality, uh, fighting patriarchy within and between diverse life ways would be a central part of such decolonization efforts and recognizing that it's not just about flows within life ways that matter, but also flows between worlds between life ways that matter for creativity. And equally, in order to expand, in order to create the space for this convivial creativity, what is required uh, very centrally is resistance against expanding colonial modernities to refuse some of the things that are coming from that direction, which are deemed toxic or uh, dispossessing. I can stop here. Uh, I have a few examples of these aspects um, that I can talk about, uh, but I will leave you, we can take them, take them up in, in questions. I'll leave you with two beautiful pictures from my part of the world um, and uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you for, for listening. Uh, and I look forward to further discussion. Thank you so much, Sarap. Um, very nice presentations and very nice pictures indeed. Um,